All right. Thank you all so much for being here this morning uh, and for joining us for today's session, Rethinking Our Curriculum, Sharing and Resources. My name is Ariel Frost, Ingenuity's Manager of Partnerships and Learning. And I'm also joined today by Courtney Sintrone, Ingenuity's Directors of Partnerships and Learning. And today's facilitator, multidisciplinary artist, brilliant person, and Constellation resident, William Estrada. This morning's session is one in a series of learning sessions developed and designed by Ingenuity's Learning and Development Provider Program residents. The program is called Constellation because the residents have come together over the last several months to ideate, knowledge share, and workshop their respective learning sessions so they can elevate key areas of their expertise, research, and experience as art partners and arts educators and share it back with you all, in essence, creating a partner-to-partner -partner learning network. So thank you to all the residents for this incredible collaboration and thoughtful work, which will continue to be presented throughout the spring and into the summer. Today's session developed by William will um, sh give us some time to do sharing resources uh, with regard to rethinking our curriculum with social justice. Before we move on, we'd like to acknowledge that this virtual classroom is taking place on the stolen land of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa nations. Because of the Great Lakes, the land naturally became a site of travel, healing, trade, and gathering for more than a dozen other native tribes, and is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois that still practice their traditions and care for the land. As we begin this program, let's honor these ancestral grounds that we're on and support the resilience and strength that all Indigenous people have shown worldwide and begin to rethink our own relationship with the land and its original people. A few important notes before we begin. If you haven't already, we invite you to update your name with your pronouns and your organization's name. And you can do that by hovering over your image icon and selecting the three dots. Note that for accessibility purposes, today's session will be recorded. Additionally, handouts and slides of the session will be available uh, later after the session. And closed captioning is also available. You can enable captions by adjusting the subtitle settings in the more section at the bottom of your screen. And one final thing before we get started, I'm just gonna briefly outline some session norms for today's institute. We've divided the session norms into a few different categories. So under equity of voice and learning, we have take space, make space, as a participant, please be mindful of any privileged identities you may hold, help to create an environment for everyone to contribute and speak from your own experience. Let's own our statements and views and not presume to be able to speak for others. And under how we show for ourselves and each other, we have openness to learning. So that's just an understanding that we're all learners in this space. Flexibility and patience, things may not always go 100% according to plan. And sometimes technology is at play. So we thank you for your grace and flexibility and use the chat box mindfully. So when you're using the chat box, we ask that you try to make your questions and comments as relevant to what we're talking about as possible and confidentiality. So take away lessons, but not personal content. We'll sometimes knowledge share and co-share ideas and resources, but if anyone shares anything personal, we ask that you don't bring it out of the space. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to William to guide us through today's session. Thank you so much, Ariel, and thank you so much, Courtney, um, for holding the space for us all. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us on this gray, sleepy uh, morning. Um, I really appreciate your presence and um, the fact that you're making time to join us and um, collaborate with us um, through this process. But, um, this next slide today, the, the focus is going to be for us to familiarize ourselves with education frameworks that support uh, individual development of critical social justice curriculum. Um, we will also identify and gather social justice art making resources that can directly that you can directly implement into your teaching practice. Um, we will also um, work towards understanding how to build um, on your own educational practice by creating 
lessons that ask critical questions and make connections to contemporary artworks, exhibits, and sites of practice. And then we will also um, work towards establishing a shared resource bank of dynamic critical social justice curriculum that will be resourced by everyone that's participating today um, and has participated in the first session, uh, conducting curriculum research in their own educational spaces. So last time that we, if you all were here for this, um, the last, um, for part one of the session, we had an introduction to the room, right? So at this point, I would also um, love for you all to introduce yourselves. You can use the chat. We're a small enough group where we can actually like engage in deeper conversations if folks are interested in unmuting. Um, but in the meantime, if you all want to throw in the chat, you know, who you are, where you're joining us from, what kind of work you do, do you do administrative work, do you do programming, are you a teaching artist, do you work um, with non-for-profits, do you work in museum institutions, you know, where, where does the learning that you do um, take place? Um, we also spend time defining what we do. I introduced my arts practice, my teaching practice last session, and we ended up um, ended up sharing the way that I'm defining cultural responsive arts education and social justice art education. At this point in time, it shifts for me, um, but we'll go through that a little bit more. Um, we ended up doing some manifestos and questions, and then also shared some resources. So for today's agenda, the plan is to, you know, kind of see who's in the room. Um, I'm going to be sharing some additional curricular examples um, that I've taught. Um, we will be revisiting the digital manifesto and we will um, add to that digital manifesto and hopefully engage in a conversation about um, what are some of the things that we need in order to create these brave spaces for us to uh, dig deeper into this work of culturally re relevant um, arts education and social justice art education. We will do an in reintroduction to public to the public Google folder, which um, you know has resources that we will go through shortly. And then the the biggest part, the biggest chunk of time, is going to be. Um, you know, doing these working groups. So part of the idea for today is for us to either work collaboratively or break out into um, breakout rooms where we're literally going to do research and workshop our lesson plans, right? Um, and just to kind of get a, a feel for the room, Right, that folks that folks bring um, uh, lesson plans that you all, or maybe breakout pairs. Yes, Courtney, um, that folks bring lesson plans that you all were interested in sharing or workshopping. Would folks be interested in doing that collaboratively, um, or are folks thinking more of generating new curriculum or lesson plans, or just? engaging in discussions about how we go about through this process of generating programming. Um, maybe we're not necessarily writing lesson plans today, but we're engaging in a much deeper conversation about, you know, the like resource sharing, right? And, and, and how we might be able to do this, but put that in the chat so you can kind of give us an idea of how we might be able to break up specifically that working session. Um, Okay, thank you, Charlie, for that. Um, yeah, but I think part of it is for us to have this working session for for us to share ideas and you know think through right uh, as individuals as as folks um, working within programs how we might be able to shape these ideas within the institutions that we work in and also for ourselves right like what are some of the things that we're interested in. Um, I know I've had conversations, some conversations with some of you about, you know, like even just like what does this look like in the city, right, uh, as individuals, and then how do we start working through collectively for us to start um, engaging these larger conversations. 
but that's going to be a big chunk of, of the of the time for today for us to kind of engage in that work. Um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll end up closing out the session by kind of having this, you know, if we do end up breaking up into smaller groups, having a, um, a, a presentation or, or share back, right, around the discussions that happened in the smaller groups. And then of course, kind of, you know, revisiting some of the some of the larger ideas that we discuss during today's uh, presentations. So that's kind of the, the the setup, and you know, you kind of see the the time that we're going through that, right? Um, if we go to the next one, right? Like, so we already did the reintroduction to the room, right? What is your name? Where do you teach or work? What resources are you interested in? Um, really quickly to um recap some of the some of the ways that i'm defining this um the next slide shows um defining cultural responsive curriculum and this is specifically the way that the international bureau of education through unesco is is defining this um and basically what it says is the curriculum that respects learners cultures and prior experiences and acknowledges and values the legitimacy of different cultures not just the dominant culture of a society and encourage intercultural understanding. Um, a lot of this work is, is emerging for me, even though I've been doing the work for, for a little bit over 20 years. Um, you know, I think over the last like eight, nine years, I've started to like understand and develop a language. And, and, and you know, that makes sense for me, right? And of course, as, um, as I, learn more, right, as I engage in more conversations with folks, it shifts, right? Um, and it's constantly, you know, I'm, I'm constantly creating and, and building the foundation, right, as to why this work is important and, and attempting, to, attempting to solidify it, right, uh, in order for me to um, not only become a stronger artist, but a stronger teacher, um, through the conversations and, and also learning from the failures of, of the work that I do. Now, the next slide, um, this is around um, defining social justice art education. And this is specifically taken from a white paper from the National Art Education Association, um, position paper, I'm sorry, not white paper, position paper. Um, and basically um, the summary of this is that artists and cultural organizations often engage with the issues of their time right and some treat the creation and or curation of art as a social practice um and to quote um the, the position paper says art can provide a meaningful catalyst to engage and empower individuals and communities to take action around the social issue uh, end of quote the processes by which people create and interact with art can help them understand and challenge inequities through art education and social justice and this is actually um, what brought me to art education in the first place. Um, my own experience in not seeing my family or um, the black and brown neighborhoods that I grew up in represented in the curriculum that I was learning in elementary and high school are the things that brought me to this work initially and continue to, to inspire and, and motivate me to continue doing this work. This next slide is something that I've been, um, you know, working through and, and, and kind of thinking and guiding some of the work that, that I do, uh, whether it's as a teacher, um, as when I do teacher training, or whenever we're talking about framing um, education, right? And it's this graphic um, by Dr. Patricia King around awareness raising and then moving to critical consciousness. Um, and you'll see this graphic, you know, I'm thinking about uh, awareness raising is around exposure to diversity, um, critical incidents, right, self-reflection, um, and then moving to critical consciousness around social justice action, critical consciousness itself, and inner group relationships, right? And then it's um, the, the, the middle point is like this uh, sustained involvement, not only for us as educators and as artists, but also for uh, the students. And then for the next slide, um, this is the way we've been, you know, been trying to frame 
the, um, the framework for this work, right? The Introduction to Critical Community Center Learning, which is emerging artist representation within the lesson, two, developing teacher-guided art projects, three, strong student-generated art projects, and then four, a critical art curriculum that goes under excelling. And these are some of the questions that I want you to consider um, as we go through some of the, the this conversation, right? Like which approach is best for you right now, right? Um, thinking about this as either as an individual or as a representative of the organization or institution that you're working with. Um, how are artists represented um, of the population you are teaching? How are artists challenging the population you are teaching, right? So for the next slide here, um, we're going to spend the next couple of minutes, and I'm going to try and make this a little bit quick, just because I want to make sure that I give folks enough time to envision a digital manifesto, but also to, um, you know, engage in the in the in the conversation, right? About um, how do we how do we think and move through the um, the work of the developing culturally relevant programming or social justice um, arts education programming as well, right? But I'm going to show you some of the some of these pieces here. Um, we've been really thinking about teaching as learning, right? Um, and again, we're going to be really framing a lot of uh, a lot of these um, uh, pieces around emerging, developing, strong, and excelling. Um, and these are really meant to guide some of the conversations that we've been that we've been um, that I'm going to be having with you all as as I show you some of the work that I do. So the next slide is you know the introduction to critical community center learning again. You know, and just to give you a heads up, I'm going to be showing you one project for each of these uh, frameworks, right? From emerging, developing, strong, and excelling. And I just want to reiterate, you know, that, um, you know, sometimes we're doing um, each of these pieces at the same time. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, there, 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 there isn't like fixed states, right, for each of these frameworks. And we can kind of navigate through through all four sometimes within the same project, right? Or sometimes we're we're uh, playing between like emerging and developing, or developing and and uh, teacher guided art projects and student generated art projects, right? So we're constantly kind of navigating through them, um, and sometimes it also depends on the on the you know students that we're working with. It depends on the you know, learning spaces that we're teaching in, and sometimes even like just the time of year, right, uh, that we're teaching in. So um, they're meant to guide us, not necessarily as definitive points, right, that we have to match, right, but just as ways to guide some of these conversations. So the next slide, you're going to see that um, for this one, we're particularly uh, thinking about artist representation within the lesson. And then some of the questions that I want you to consider is, you know, who are you centering, right? What are the artists that you are centering in the work? Um, how are the artists representative of the population you are teaching? And then how are the artists challenging the population you are teaching, right? Um, for this particular slide, um, for the next slide that um, we have for you here, um, I'm particularly looking at folk art, specifically tin ornaments. Um, tin ornaments are, um, you know, literally, you know, folk artists from Mexico and Latin America and across other other parts of the world use. Yeah, oh, no, go ahead, Cardi. Those are uh, that's wonderful. We'll show a little part. Oh, you want to go to the video? I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, we won't watch the full two minutes, right? But, um, this is uh, Tonala, um, which is the mecca for ceramics, tin, and woodwork uh, in Mexico. And I was just also oh lucky to have grown up here. Um, this was one of uh, this is actually on 
you know, what would be considered like a suburb of Jalisco, of, of Guadalajara, Jalisco, which is where where um, I grew up. And every Thursday and Sunday, um, they had the tianguis or the market. Um, so I was, you know, I grew up with all this. So now every time that I go visit my parents, um, you know, every time that we go to Mexico, you know, it's one of the places where I go to to talk to um, artists and to look at the, you know, at the newest inventions, right, that they've been creating with this work. So uh, because tin ornaments are, have a long history uh, in Mexico and throughout the whole world, right? Um, we're going to stop corning here and move on to the next slide. Um, and we'll share that video if, if folks are interested in, in seeing it. What we've been doing is, um, you know, early on in the school year, um, thinking about, you know, who is an artist, right? Um, and, and I start with some of these projects because I do get a lot of students that don't see themselves as artists because they don't see themselves represented in the canon of, of who is considered an artist, right? So we, I try to bring in work that exists within their neighborhood, work that they could experience, right? Um, because they might have it in their home um, and really, um, you know, frame it in a way that allows them to see that work as belonging within this all of, within this history of art making. Um, and for this one particularly, we really look at tin ornaments and then we start thinking about symbols about our culture, right? Like what are some of the things, what are some of the images that are representative of our identity, of our culture, of our neighborhood? And then students end up generating uh, small samples, right, of, of cultural icons that are representative of either their neighborhood, their culture, or, or you know, kind of daily routines, right? So we have a small little cactus, uh, a paleta. The next slide, we have uh, some churros, which are, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with churros, but, you know, they're this deliciousness, right, of, um, actually, you know what? I have no idea what churros are made of. I just know that they're delicious and it has brown sugar. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but we have the corn and then we have um, um, a, oh my goodness, what is this? What is the name of this toy? Like the, yeah, right, Lynn? It's like donuts, right? It's like the donut piece, but it's just kind of elongated here. Is that a dreidel? Is it, it's a dreidel. It's like the top, like the spinning tops. Yeah. Right. So, um, so yeah. And then the next slide, you know, we have, of course, you know, another, another cacti or cactus, right. And, and a taco, right. Um, you know, and, and we've used some of these symbols in various ways. Um, and usually what we end up doing is like really thinking about the symbolism of these images, right? Like what they mean. Um, and then, you know, we can work through different different images as of course, you know, as a visual artist, a lot of the examples that I'm gonna be teach, uh, showing you are, are based on, on things that I've taught, um, you know, but thinking about whether you're a musician, whether you're uh, do performance, dance, right? Like thinking about what are some of the aspects of the stories that are already exists within the schools, within the neighborhoods that you're teaching in, that you might be able to uh, center and focus on and make connections, right? To like some of the work that already exists. Um, the next couple of slides you're gonna see, you know, there's all there's a really, really famous show in Mexico called El Chavo del Ocho, which is basically um, uh, a uh, small community, right? And, and kind of the mishaps of this uh, orphan child, right? That kind of um, this, this neighborhood has adopted, um, but he wears a hat, you know? And it's like, he wears a hat and this is like this cultural icon. Um, and for generations, it has really defined um, comedy in Mexico and it has influenced uh, so many, you know, adults and children. Uh, along, um, not only in Mexico, but all through Latin America. 
Uh, there's another painting, right, uh, of the elote, right, um, of the corn um, on a stick. And again, thinking about these cultural icons and what it means, we have the little village arch, right, which is uh, um, one of the monuments that it's um, um, has centered Little Village um, neighborhood in Chicago, if folks are not familiar with it. Um, the next piece, we have a pride flag, right, that one of our students created in order to think of, again, you know, representation um, and things that they wanted to honor that were important to them. And then we also have uh, the Puerto Rican flag. And in this particular context, we were also <laughs> Uh, we're also having conversations, right, of um, the fact that specifically within Chicago, right, when we think of Latino, we think of Mexican, and the fact that Latinidad um, is varied, and it's, you know, so much more, right, than, than Mexican, right? Um, so thinking about just the variety of, of peoples in Latin America. So this is the first one. We're going to move on to the second piece right here. Uh, the second piece is around teacher-guided art projects uh, that model art as a research tool. This is a, a visual arts integration unit that I ended up doing with a science teacher for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Uh, the science teacher, her name is Elizabeth Pagan at the Bochcali Elementary. Most of these are actually um, at the Bochcali Elementary. But we particularly started looking at the work of Nicole Marroquin, which is a uh, um, a visual artist and a professor at SAC, along with um, Paulina Camacho Valencia, which was, uh, she's a high school teacher, or, or she was a high school teacher at Juarez um, High School. And the next slide, they, they ended up creating these beautiful research projects around future homes. Um, and basically what they started doing is they really started thinking uh, about um, they not only photograph uh, homes in the neighborhood and businesses in the neighborhood, but they also did research through Google, uh, Google Maps specifically, and, and, and kind of captured those images. But part of it was they ended up developing proposals for development, right, without displacing the people in the neighborhood. So we ended up using some of this research. Um, the next slide is um, they actually presented this work at the Chicago Cultural Center as part of an exhibition there. But we ended up taking this initial idea um, and, and, and thought about how they were using art as a research tool to kind of propose solutions to problems that existed in the neighborhood. And if you see the next slide, what we started thinking about, we started mapping out their own home. Right, we studied the size of a Chicago lot, right, and 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 how big that was, right. We really started thinking about um, the structural systems of of community planning and and just uh, the built environment. Um, Liz Pagan, the science teacher, was specifically thinking uh, for this particular unit. She was uh, teaching um, alternative energy models. So we studied solar energy, we studied uh, wind power, we studied geothermal. Um, and what students ended up creating is they like looked at the homes that they were, that they lived in. We recreated these maquettes, right, of a Chicago lot. And then we proposed for them to use the same facades of their homes and reimagine their homes um, as, as energy efficient spaces, right? So you'll see solar powered, you'll see in the next slide, you'll be able to see that they ended up um, installing um, a wind, wind power generator, right? Uh, the orange are actual, uh, they're supposed to represent uh, thermal, uh, thermal energy uh, from, um, from geothermal um, uh, uh, systems. And then the blue barrels are supposed to be uh, rain, uh, rain barrels, right? That are used to collect uh, water for, for, you know, we started thinking about like filtration systems, you know, in order for us to clean that water. 
but then also like just the reclamation of gray water, right? Um, and this last one is one of my favorite ones uh, because the students were, you know, were like really, really love soccer and they're like, we have to have a soccer field uh, in our home, right? But what we started doing is we really started thinking about, um, you know, design as a way to, you know, really meet the needs of their own particular families without displacing them, right? Um, and in the process, like really thinking about um, the resources that exist in Chicago already um, that they might be able to apply um, for their home. Now, this next third project is a student generated art projects, right? Um, that model art as a research tool used to address society. Um, I'm, I'm particularly, I, I really love this, this project for a couple of reasons. One is because, um, you know, students as a visual arts teacher, right? Um, as a teaching artist that, you know, focuses mostly on visual arts, uh, students are constantly asking, um, if we go to the next slide, um, we started, uh, oh, I'm so sorry, Courtney, can you go back to the, so some of the questions that I want you to consider for this, right, is really thinking about uh, inviting students to share things that affect them, their communities directly by mapping the injustices, how can we encourage students to research artists who use art to address the same or similar injustice? And then how can we encourage students to present or exhibit their work outside of the classroom, right? These are some of the questions that, you know, for us to consider through this. But for this particular project, if we move on to the next slide, you know, students were, were you know, really enamored with, with clay, right? Which is something that we don't have a kiln, we don't have access to a kiln. Um, you know, clay can be very expensive, right? Um, but what we started doing is we started taking all these ideas around symbolism. We started thinking about, you know, how do we use, um, um, what are some of the things that we find in our homes that might be made out of clay? So we started first with, with plates, right? And thinking about what is a plate? What, what do we serve on a plate? Um, what are some of the, um, what are some of the, the, the things that we use plates for? Um, for these particular pieces, we started doing like coil, uh, coil building uh, in order to create like these clay plates. Um, what we started doing is we started using the slip um, and glaze in order to create patterns. Um, the next one, you're going to see that uh, students know that, um, that a lot of my work is as a screen printer. And they asked me, they're like, you know, can, can you show us how to screen print on clay? And I was like, I don't think you can do that. Um, but sure enough, you can screen print on clay. Um, and what we ended up doing is we actually ended up um, writing um, Creative Schools uh, fund um, grant, you know, and we received it in order to partner up with Firebird um, a community um, program. Um, and what we ended up doing was we started, uh, we brought in Salvador Jimenez Flores, which is a local artist which does clay and printmaking. And we actually learned, I learned so much from these rich collaborations. Um, you know, I like clay, but I'm a little intimidated by it. So I try not to do it. Um, but by bringing in Salvador Jimenez Flores, by bringing in Firebird Community um, Art Center, right? Like we really started building like these, um, these really, amazing, beautiful collaborations around the exploration and experimentation based on the, the students' wants, right? Um, and what we ended up doing is like, we all learned how to do this. Salvador was probably like the only one that was really an expert on screen printing using slip and um, and then actually transferring, transferring them onto the, transferring them onto the actual um, bowls, but we ended up creating bowls plates and cups, right? And each student uh, from pre-kindergarten through eighth grade ended up generating two, either two bowls, two cups, or two plates. 
Uh, one of them they ended up holding on to, right? And the other one, um, what we ended up doing is that at the end of the at the end of the uh, program, we actually had a community celebration. And part of the grant funding that we ended up uh, getting through the Creative Schools Fund was we actually um, paid a, a, a women's um, collective here in Little Village um, through the Double Chile Community Education Fund to actually make aguas frescas, so fresh water, like, you know, sweet water, and also um, food for us. And we had a huge community um, gathering where we gave away all the plates all the bowls and all the cups, um, you know, and that was like what we were using to serve. So if you want to go to the next one, um, to the next, um, and we literally had, had, you know, hundreds of cups, plates and, and bowls um, as part of the community event. And, you know, folks would, would, you know, be able to grab one of these and then actually take them take them home with them or serve themselves, you know, the, the food that was, you know, we had purchased as part of our community celebration. But again, this would have never happened, right? <laughs> if, if, if students wouldn't have been insistent on, 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 you know, using clay and then trying to figure out like the resources. And of course, you know, through the creative school funds, um, which there was no way we would have been able to, to do that, or at least at this scale, you know, without that support. So um, the next piece is, yeah, Lynn, I think that was really another piece, right? That, that we were able to um, work with this, um, um, you know, women's collaborative, or, um, you know, which is really around, you know, like teaching women in Little Village how to be entrepreneurs. Um, you know, to, you know, and hiring them, right? And, and, you know, for them to make some food and then we were able to give it, a, give it away, um, which the Pochkali like does that all the time, you know, and, and they work with them very closely. So we were really familiar with the work that were, they were doing, but it was, it was quite, quite a, a sight to see, right? Um, and then also like just people's experience of like, wait a minute, like I can take, I can take one of these for free. Right, which is not a new concept, right? Like there's tons of organizations that do like soup bowl fundraisers, you know, um, or do, um, you know, fundraisers where you take a clay bowl, right? As part of the food that they serve. But um, the thing that I, I thought made it special for us was that everything was free, right? And students were, you know, very much to, very much to uh, a story that I was sharing with Courtney and Ariel earlier on for the tin ornaments that I tried to make this tin ornament mural. And we give a lot of stuff away. Uh, and I was like, no, you're not supposed to take those tin ornaments. That was supposed to be for a mural, right? Very much to that point, right? Like these pieces are, are, are kind of geared in that way. Um, and then this next project, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, I've been really lucky to be at the Pochicali for, this will be 20 years that I've been working there as a teaching artist, um, uh, as a teaching artist or a visual arts teacher. Um, I worked as part-time as doing that work. Um, and, you know, because the school is, um, was, was created as part of the small schools, um movement in the in the, um in the 90s um you know teachers created it with the intention of it being a dual language school right so most of the work that i do as a teaching artist is in spanish um which i had to relearn and reclaim uh when i started working there um a lot of the work that they do is also there's uh art integrated already right so they actually they have a teaching artist a visual arts teaching artist they have a musician uh teaching art or music teaching artist and then they also have a theater slash performance teaching artist we were all miscellaneous employees um as part of chicago public schools right and you know i think the the youngest one is um 
uh, Sarah Godin. And I mean, the youngest one, like she's been there the, the, the least amount of time. And I think she's going on like 16 years, right? Um, Renato Ceron, um, you know, which is a, the musician that's been working with the Pochcali. I think he's been there for 22, 23 years. Um, you know, and then there's me, right? That has been there for 20 years. Um, but we work with all the school, right? From pre-K through 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 eighth grade. Um, and, and we also work across other schools, right? As teaching artists as independent contractors as well. And we also have other partnerships, right? Like as a school, we also have other partnerships. But not to say, you know, that this work has really been, um, you know, we, we try and, 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 and be intentional, but it's also very exploratory, right? And, and, and we're constantly working with students in not only rethinking our curriculum, but also uh, re, revitalizing it, right? Because it, sometimes it becomes a little stagnant. As amazing as it might be, it becomes stagnant sometimes, right? So in these particular questions, I want you to think about, you know, how do, can we rethink about our, our curriculum so it's used as a research tool that celebrates people's experiences? It complicates the histories that we learn and that we are taught and critically analyzes the problems that are present in the community. Um, you know, very much to the point of some of the other frameworks, right? Like centering artists of the global majority, who address the themes of the curriculum that we're attempting to teach. And then of course, invite people to col collaborate on, on, on these projects. Um, this particular piece, we look um, at various artists and the, the, um, the work that they, the narratives that they tell, right? About, about family, about neighborhoods. And there's so many artists, right? Like we look at James, um, uh, Carrie James Marshall, right? We look at Carmen Lomas Garza, um, amongst many other artists. Um, Carrie Mae Weems, we look at the work of Carrie Mae Weems and some of her photographs. And, you know, for this particular project, like where I'm showing you some watercolors, but we've done a multitude of art materials or, or um, pieces that we do, but a lot of them we talk about traditions, right? Like, what is a tradition? What is a chosen family and what is a biological family, right? right? What makes a tradition a tradition? Um, here we have uh, Una looking at the Great Bake Off, right? A uh, British bakery show. Um, but thinking about what are some of the things that you do with either your biological or chosen family that are special to you, right? Um, and thinking through this process, right? Uh, not only of reimagining, um, you know, what narratives we tell and, and, and rethinking about how can we insert our own experience into these historical contexts of our city, right? But not, um, but also thinking through the process of like, how is my experience similar or different to those of my peers, right? And to those of other folks um, in, in the neighborhood. Um, you know, and one of the things that I've been, that I've really been really, you know, kind of working through, but also struggling with a bit, right, is that, you know, sometimes students will tell me, it's like, but Maestro William, right, like, what if my family doesn't have any traditions, right, um, because they, they're either newly arrived, or just because they don't see their family as having traditions, right, and thinking about the complexity of those conversations, right? Um, and also the fact that, you know, as, as much as we want to say that, you know, uh, family is really important, family is very complicated as well, right? Um, and what does it mean for us to also be in this vulnerable space, right, where we have to critically analyze our family in comparison to others, right? Um, and engage in those conversations about what our family might do or might not do, right? Um, so thinking through, right, like what are what are the things that we want for ourselves, um, and and what are some of the things that we want to, you know, 
to 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 acknowledge um and i hope i'm gonna say like really love this image of all these penguins um you know <laughs> but thinking about these relationships right and like for the these this particular uh this is actually uh they're twins right and 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 one of the twins is like obsessed with with penguins um and thinking right about you know how yes right like she has a relationship with with her family and her brother you know but the the relationship is really with her sister right which is her twin um and and why that's special um and and thinking about you know how do we engage in these really complex discussions um you know which we then you know really set up to begin exploring through other projects now as we move on to the next project right it's like um i want to invite you to to um look at this manifesto so in the next slide i usually use this project as a way for us to start engaging in conversations around the learning spaces that we we need for ourselves as teachers as educators as artists um, and then also what kind of learning spaces do we want to create for the students that we want to work with, right? So using this template of a manifesto, right, and thinking about a, a public declaration, right, that we want to make. Um, I have an example here in the next slide um, where, you know, I've invited, um, in this particular case, I invited um, artists to think about, you know, what kind of things they would need in order to make the best work possible. Um, and I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing, right? So I'm gonna drop a link on the chat. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna, everyone should have access to that. Um, but if you can open that link, um, you'll see, uh, 20 slides of, of this manifesto jam board. Um, and if you wanna start in slide four or so, one of the questions that I want you, that I want you to think about, um, and we can do this individually, we can do this collaboratively and engage in discussions for this, but I wanna ask, what do you, what do you need, right? As, as the facilitator, as the artist, as the educator, um, what do you need to create your ideal learning environment, right? Where you can build a brave space with your students so they may be able to see themselves as agents of change, right? Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with the term brave space. Uh, brave space came out of a conversation. Um, oh man, I'm like forgetting her name right now. Um, from when, when we started engaging in discussions around safe spaces, creating safe spaces. And the fact that, you know, sometimes safe spaces were problematic because when we were addressing race, when we were addressing uh, injustice, right? Um, a lot of people would feel attacked. So, um, so that space no longer became a safe space for people, right? So the conversation was really, around creating brave spaces that challenged um, notions around, um, you know, who is it a safe space for, right? <laughs> um, thinking about brave spaces as spaces where we are challenging each other, we are listening to each other with intent, but we're also, we're also thinking critically about, you know, what we say, how we say, very much to what Ariel and Courtney have done for us today here, right? Of thinking about, you know, speaking from our own truths and not making generalizations of of, of lived experience of, of others and, and, you know, listening with intent and with, with respect, right? So if you all want to, you know, spend a little bit of time on slide four, of the manifesto and what you can do is have folks use um jamboard before we want to start creating a little 
little sticky notes and writing. What are the things, and I would, I, I want to say, right, like, what are the things that you need from the institution that you work for, right, in order to create these brave spaces for you to learn, learn and teach in. What do you need from, like, the structural systems, right, from the schools, from the school districts? What do you need from the teachers and students that you're working with? Mm -hmm. And how would, how would, I'm like reading this one, like primarily I want to feel safe and my coworkers to feel safe. And how could we do that, right? Like what would need to be in place in order for, for you and your coworkers to feel safe? Mm -hmm. And again, thinking about how oh my has resources, right? thinking about this comment of a, a space that is intentionally cultivated for a group of people. So how do we intentionally cultivate that space? What do we need? Right? Do we, you know, do we need a space for us to, um, like actually the physical space, right? Like have agency over the physical space and the design even just the furniture that we're, we're able to sit on and use, right? Being able to move that furniture, right? I know sometimes I've taught in spaces where I'm not allowed to touch anything, right? Resources, right? Flexibility. I think sometimes flexibility in how we teach, what we teach. There are any other things that you would say that you would need? Share responsibility. Can we, would we be able to, to expand on that? The share responsibility and flexibility? I think sometimes those are too, too connected, right? Share responsibility of what? The share responsibility of like holding space for each other is a share responsibility over what we teach, how we teach it. How fast or how slow we're able to teach, right? And sometimes we're, we're um, there's these external like deadlines or pressures of like things need to move through, right? Because there, there's gonna be a performance, there's gonna be an exhibition. So we have to move towards that, right? And, and, and we only have a certain allotted amount of time. Are there any other things that you would consider I, I don't know if it's okay to speak. Um, yes, of course, Charlie. Okay, I didn't add the um, responsibility one, but I was just sitting here thinking about it. And it would be great if in our space, there was a shared responsibility around just the goals and the intention of why <laughs> we're doing the work. Um, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I think, you know, Charlie, even like, um, yeah, right. Like, like to treat to treat them more as collaborations, right? Of of, you know, these are like this is my expertise, right? Um, this is what I do. This is what I'm interested. This is why I signed up to teach this, <laughs> right? Even just that point of like transparency and vulnerability, um, from the institution, right? Like saying like, hey, this is how much money we actually have for this. Right, like this is what the grant 
we wrote for, or this was the intention or the mission of this particular program, right? But then also the school, right? Like and inviting the school into those conversations and being like, you know, what are your needs? Why do you want us here, right? Like what are, um, and when I say the school, I mean like the administration, the teacher, if we're partnering up with the teacher doing arts integration, um, and even the students, right? Like thinking, thinking about, you know, what are what are the things that are of interest, right? Uh, like why are you inviting us into your into your school, uh, into this learning environment? But yeah, Charlie, I think that's so important, right? Like to just even have that share responsibility. Because we um William, I was also, I'm the one who um, created that um, uh, initial sticky note. And I think I appreciate you asking me to lean into that and think a little more deeply about what that was. And through this conversation, I realized that it, there's a piece about accountability there. Um, and, and I was thinking about accountability in terms of everyone in the space has not just value, but purpose in the room and in really leaning into that purposeful contribution, purposeful um, uh, ideas. But then you were talking about um, the whole school um, administration and the purpose behind the work. Um, and I think there's accountability there too. So for me, I think that piece about accountability is a real rich, vibrant place that I would lean into. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, I think part of it is like, like why, why are we showing up to these spaces, right? Um, not only as, you know, not only as, as, as the teaching artists or, or, you know, the institutions or an organization, but even just the school in itself, right? Like, why is the school holding the space for, for this art making to happen? Um, and it varies, right? Like sometimes depending on the, the capacity of all the people involved, sometimes it's like, because we don't have it, right? Um, because the opportunity presented itself, right? And, and, and we wanted to hold on to that opportunity um, without necessarily like a deeper intention, right? And, and, and it's not to put a value system on like, this is better than the other, but it's about understanding, right? Of like why, why folks are interested in this particular work at that particular time. Um, because it does become about accountability and also capacity, right? I know sometimes, you know, there's, there's just uh, not enough time to build the rich programming that you would that you would, you know, that you would want to build, right? Or, or enough resources, right? To, to dedicate, to, to build the programming that you um, absolutely want. So thinking about all the different pieces that kind of play into, um, play into this, this, this particular work. I know, I think I, I saw someone just come in, so I'm just sharing the Jamboard. If, uh, um, is it Eleni, Eleni? Um, if you wanna join us for the Jamboard, we're creating like these digital manifestos right now, which we're gonna close up in a little bit and start moving, moving about to the next piece, which is to work collaboratively or engage in a conversation, right? I'm going to share some resources with you all. Um, here, which one should I? So I am going to share. Um, Courtney, would you mind if I if I share my screen? All right, so I'm gonna share so this particular um, link that I'm gonna share with you all right now is the link that I hope that we will start 
looking through and so it's Ingenuity's Constellation Residency. Um, and part of this, actually, let me open that up and make sure that that's the one. Yes. So um, you should be able to see this uh, culturally relevant, relevant and social justice art education resources. And there's a number of, of different resources that we're looking at, right? So here's the first one, Artist Resources. Um, which literally, like, this is my own personal collection. Um, it's not organized as great as as I would like it to, but you know, um, this is a resource that I will that I'm going to invite you all to add to, to clarify, um, to um, uh, obviously to add to as well, right? Um, but basically, um, and you can do it based on on themes and create new folders if you'd like to but for the particular piece around um artist representation which is the first one right like this would be a really great place to start thinking about what artists are missing right what are some of the themes that are missing that you would like to see right and start thinking about how you might be able to populate them right by either um researching artists, um, you know, adding sites to this that we might be able to then um, uh, access later on. You know, this will be, this would be, uh, like, this is the work of Edward Bertinsky. I don't know if folks are familiar. He's a photographer, Canadian photographer, um, that looks at um, uh, specifically that photographs um, a lot of uh, environmental justice um, issues. Um, and not a problem, Charlie, completely understand. Um, but yes, this is this is going to be a resource that you all are going to have access to. And I hope that we will continue building through it, right? Like it's just for, for us to go through these pieces. Um, the other piece that I wanted to show you is um, I was lucky enough to work with the Chicago Cultural Alliance um, in developing these, the beginning of lesson plans, right? So um, you can start going through some of these and start generating potential ideas for new ways of looking at programming um, for you to, you know, take this, this sample. And I'm actually um, really excited that the Department of Art Education at CPS just um, released the new um, like lesson template that they're they're going to be that they're going to be using, um, and I'm like super excited because I know like as you know education practitioners we're always like which lesson plan do we use right so just like even having a template that we can play with and that we can all kind of be thinking about it in, in similar ways um, is really helpful, but. This is the lesson plan that I kind of use, the format that I use, um, and I do teacher training at UAC, so I have like my students do this, but we're gonna be using the CPS uh, lesson plan template um, starting next year, so I'm like super excited about it. But you can kind of go through these, right, and, and see what they, what they look like. Um, this is particularly looking at the cross-cultural engagement toolkit that, um, that the Chicago Cultural Alliance ended up um, uh, generating um, in collaboration with uh, the uh, well, the gap funding from the Illinois Humanities. But I'll leave you with that one there. And then the other piece too is, um, you know, I wanted to see if we could actually create a new folder, which I'm actually going to create it. Um, So I'm gonna say like lesson plans or programming ideas. Um, and I'm actually gonna invite you uh, to generate Google Docs in here and actually start generating programming ideas that you would be interested in us workshopping or us helping you um, through the development process, right? And and the next the next say like the next like 30 minutes or so I want to see if we might be able to break up into groups and, and go through that process of sharing 
and, and engaging in these conversations. I'm gonna share, there's a couple of other ones that I'm gonna be, I'm actually gonna drop all of these links in for everyone. I do wanna share, right? Um, there are some lesson ideas in, in here, right? For out there with Master William and different ways of looking at that. There are some other lesson ideas on this Illinois Humanity Reaction Exhibition on the way that different artists are using different ways of creating artwork. Um, obviously, there's the website for the Chicago Cultural Alliance um, and the different arts organizations that exist throughout the city of Chicago uh, cultural centers that we will have access to. And, and I encourage, I highly encourage you all to um, go through their members and see what cultural centers are near your neighborhood or your school or wherever you teach, um, wherever you live, uh, because there's like some like really hidden gems, right? That I was just like, I didn't even know that existed. Um, but you know, you'll have access to all of these, of course, you know, through through our our through this work that we're doing, and then also through um, just um, the, the conversations, but these are all just resources for you all to look at in, in case you're wondering about, you know, how you might be able to put some of these ideas into practice. So, all right, so I'm going to try and stop talking and invite you all to share how you would like to use the next like 30 minutes or so. Should we break down into smaller breakout groups? Part of today's intention was to workshop some programming ideas, maybe lessons for us to engage in deeper conversations about how we can do this work. Would it be helpful to do it in smaller breakout groups? Does this feel better for folks? What are folks' capacities for, for this conversation right now? You're more than welcome to unmute yourself or write it on the chat, whatever you feel the most comfortable with. Hey, um, so again, hi everyone, I'm Alexis. I work at Red Clay, I'm a program manager. I am open to anything really, but just throwing out there that since I sit on the program management side, that's kind of um, where I'm coming from and participating in these conversations. It's just helpful to get a perspective from um, the direct server. So the TA um, or the teacher. Um, and so I don't really know how or what you can do with what I just shared, but I just wanted to engage with you. <laughs> Alexis, are there particular questions that you're curious about? Um, in this moment, no, I am I appreciated reviewing the manif manifesto because I got to review um, the one that I worked on with the group. And I appreciated that group because I was working with two teaching artists who are also connected with performance art. And so mm -hmm. being able to kind of hear that feedback um, and perspective from them in the current climate that we're in, in arts education. Um, so I guess maybe the best way to answer that is being in a space to hear more from people who are actively working as teaching artists, or maybe they're another arts partner as well. Okay. No, thank you, Alexis. Cause yeah, I mean, I can continue talking. I have like no, pro I have like plenty of stuff, but you know, but part yeah. of this is the <laughs> part of this is just like engaging in these discussions, right? Because um, I think it, they just become, I don't know, I think they're richer, you know, but. Um, I, I would just say I agree with uh, Alexis. I did not bring any lesson plans, but I am enjoying learning um, from you, William, and and all that this conversation might yield. Um, in particular, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about the structure that you presented um, emerging through excelling and how you might approach that if you were either in um, a year long program or whether you are in a residency, how you might employ that particular structure. That would be interesting for me too. Okay. 
And William, I think it might also be interesting um, to talk about some of how you engage your um, teacher students in this type of work, especially with um, people who are more on a program manager level that might be helpful for how they engage with their teaching artists. Okay. Um, Eleni or Megan, do you have any any thoughts or any? Sure, I can share something that I struggle with in particular in my program and maybe um, your perspective as a visual artist or people who are in arts organizations outside of music might have ideas to share with me. Um, something that's very challenging for my organization is that we are a music school that traditionally teaches um, Western tonal music and Western instruments. Um, and the community that we serve, um, their background is not that. Um, and so how do we adapt our curriculum and our approach to teaching music to make sure that we are reflecting the incredible artistic wealth of our community? Um, how do we adapt that to what the, the Western tonal instruments that we teach? And it's a huge challenge. And I don't think there's any easy answer, but I would love ideas from other, I feel like maybe as a visual artist, it's a little bit more, you can maybe a bit more directly reflect your own experiences. So how, how do we encourage that in a, in a musical setting? Or mm -hmm. I, I would love more ideas for that. Okay. And I know that's a very challenging question, but I'm just, just no. throwing it well, there, like rethinking our curriculum. That's like something that is so important to me and so challenging in, yeah. in my work. No, I mean, but thank, thank you so much for bringing that up because I think, you know, you know, we, I know I encounter this conversation too with, uh, with like dance, right? Uh, you know, there, you know, the multitude of dance instructors and teaching artists that work for Chicago Public Schools, you know, we're constantly engaging in conversation around like, you know, there's tons of resources for visual arts, right? But like, but where are the resources for like dance and music, right? There, there, there isn't as many. And, and I know that CPS, the Department of CPS, um, the Department of Arts Education at CPS is working on, on developing and getting more resources, right? But they're still, they're still in development, right? Um, and I think part of it is, um, you know what I what I would say to that Megan. You know, and 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 even to to the to like some of the questions that Alexis brought up um, is, you know, for for me, you know, I'm I'm trying to. I usually focus on on like the questions that I'm trying to answer or the questions that I'm asking, right, and and try to answer them through the art making that I'm doing. Um, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, I come, I come from, I come to this work, uh, from, from like inquiry, right. Um, from inqu inquiry based learning specifically where I'm asking a question, um, and I'm trying to answer it through the art making that, um, that I'm, that I'm, you know, engaging in. So whether that's through, you know, big ideas or themes that we're exploring and, you know, whether that's like through narrative. Um, Megan, I'm not sure when you say that you focus on, on instrument, is, is it like literally like teaching students how to use particular instruments? Yes, yeah, so, so the instruments that we offer are orchestral instruments, so woodwinds, brass, percussion, and then piano and guitar. So our, our students are studying those instruments in particular. Okay. So yeah, I think, I think part of it for me is that, you know, like it is very much about the instrument, right? But it's also about the stories that the instruments um, hold, right? Um, how the instruments were created, right? What, what were, what were, 
how were the instruments created in response to what, right? How are the instruments used? How have they changed, right? How have, um, even just thinking about sound, right? And, and, and um, you know, and I'm going to like the 80s with synthesizers, right? And just like the conversations about, you know, is, a, is playing a synthesizer the same as playing an actual um, like wooden instrument, right? Um, and just like th those complications, right, that, that are presented in the work that we're, the work that we're creating and the challenges, right, that the work, that the work presents as, as like time and place and politics shift. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm just thinking right now too, on uh, um, even within the visual arts world, right. And like the NFTs, which I'm still trying to figure out what they are. Right. But, um, like being able to think about what, well, if I'm selling a digital work of art, right. Is that the same as, you know, selling a painting, right. And, and what are the, if, if, if there isn't something that's physical, um, and the complications that our work as artists um, present within the world that we're living in, right? And how those those conversations are shifting. Um, and I think part of it is that, you know, I think there's I think there's a a want, right, for for our programming, for the programming that we do to exist in the formats that are relevant and current. And I don't think that's always necessary, right? I think, I think there's, I think you don't have to change. If you do programming, right? I don't think that programming should be shifted. I think that programming should exist in the way that it exists. I think if the interest is to make programming that is more connected to the neighborhoods, to the students that you're working with, then new programming should be generated, right? That actually does that, right? So it doesn't feel forced. So it doesn't feel, so you're, so you're not attempting to make connections that might not be there. Um, and I think that goes for every, for any of our, our practices, right? And I think that that's where 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 we end up, you know. At least I know as a teaching artist, right? Where where because I don't understand something specifically, then there's a lot of there's a lot of assumptions that I'm making about like how the, those connections are made, um, and I think it goes back to you know this this idea, right, of like generating um, programming right that is collaborative with the populations that we're attempting to work with right um yes and you know reiterating what Courtney just wrote in the in the in the chat right it's just about like allowing ourselves the space and flexibility to expand on the curriculum you know uh, in a way that speaks to students um where they're where they are and then also, you know, um, that gives them agency over the direction of the learning, right? Um, and I think, you know, we, we can do that, you know, but there needs to be enough flexibility in our programming in order for that to happen. Um, so it's the flexibility piece, you know, and I think not, I think as in, in at least in the in institutions and the organizations that I work with, there's certain there's certain programming that allows for that flexibility to happen, and then there's also um, there's also you know programming that just doesn't allow that because of the time restraints, um, because of the funding restraints, right? Um, and I think that's where you know as teaching artists as um, as programming directors, as folks that are doing programming, I think that's where we also have to push, right? And 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 create a case for for ourselves 
and for the for the organizations that we work in in order to create that flexibility and space to play right and to and to explore new ways of looking at the work that we do in the spaces that we're interested in working in but sorry yeah thank, thank you for that i think that gives me some some a different perspective on this on this challenge um, and Ariel, I agree with you. One easy thing to do is to make sure that contributions, the story of contributions of people from diverse backgrounds are told because they're not always told and they're not always shared. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I agree with that as well. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask William, I'll turn my camera on, um, about that in regards to um, you were talking about, um, I have to confess, I am always intimidated to say the name of the school. Tepatrikali, is that I'd correct? Study, yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, you talk specifically about how you work with such intentionality around that particular community and that particular culture in terms of representation through art and artists. And, um, and I wonder, like, do do you feel like if you were to go and do similar work in Bronzeville, would you um, recenter that curriculum around that particular community in terms of art that is made, artists that are um, presented? And I just wanna wanted to see how you think about that when you are going into various communities to work. Yeah. You know, and I think thank you for asking that because I think that's uh, I think that's why I focus on the ideas, right? Um, and thinking about you know, um, like thinking about the ten ornaments, right? Thinking about you know what what symbols, right, or what objects would represent your experience, your culture, your neighborhood, right? Because um, I'm not necessarily focusing on representing a particular culture but the things that symbolize that particular culture, right? Uh, what narratives, what are family traditions? You know, um, it just, it just, um, yeah, I think, I think that's a, the, a big part of why I focus on the, um, on like the question that I'm asking or the themes that I'm attempting to address because it's never necessarily about that particular like neighborhood or experience, but it's about the experience for that particular student or that particular, you know, moment in time. Um, and then, you know, it kind of alle it alleviates some of the pressure of, you know, at least for me, right, of, of having to rethink this you know, like what is a symbol, right? Because if I ask what is a symbol, you know, I don't have to have the answer for that, right? Like, but we can explore that answer and figure out like, well, is that, like, what does a symbol mean to you within this particular context in this neighborhood, right? What narratives do they tell, right? Like what, what stories do they tell about your neighborhood and do you like them? Right? Um, do you want to tell some a different story that isn't usually told, right? And I think across spaces, whether that's with the, whether that's like within neighborhoods, whether that's within culture, within peoples, right? I think it's it's the for me starting through inquiry and 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 starting through the questions that I'm attempting to to ask and maybe answer. Right, that I think that leads to some of the deeper conversations, um, you know. And I think to 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 your point here, you know, it's like this is where like those four frameworks, um, you know. I know that I'm not always going to have the time, right, to to engage in like deeper conversations. Um, so sometimes it's like, you know, we're gonna do we're gonna do this project, whatever project that might be, and we only have, you know, 
an hour, right? Like those drop-in programs where it's just like, we're going to do, we're going to do it for an hour, right? And I'm trying to teach them like a skill or a technique, but then, then it just, it just poses a question, right? Like, well, what can, what other things can you do with this technique? And these are all the artists that we, that use this particular technique in their work or that are asking similar questions in their work, right? Um, because then I know that at least they're, you know, the students, whether they're, they're like young people or whether they're like big kids, right? I know that at least they'll see that artists across cultures um, are addressing similar questions or are using similar materials in a way, right? But it also means that I have to do my research. It means that I have to figure out, right? Like, where are, where are my own biases? Where's my own lack of knowledge, you know? Um, which is exit, which it exists, right? Like, um, as much as I love this work, you know, um, I don't know everything about it, the work, right? Like, I just don't have knowledge. I don't, I don't know what I don't know, because I don't know it, right? Um, and I think that's one of the, the, the things that when I'm teaching in a classroom, uh, when I'm teaching out in the neighborhood, when I'm teaching in a program, um, yes, Courtney, right? Like, I know you could screen prank Clay, you know, on Clay, you know, and students were like, yeah, why not? And I was like, I don't know. And then when we, I did research and I asked folks that actually not do, they're like, oh yeah, you could totally do that. I was like, how? Um, you know, but I think, I think it's even just that vulnerability of saying, I don't know how to do that let's see let's see if anyone else knows how to or invite people into the conversation um on what we can do right to to actually learn these new things which i think this this part two of this professional development it's kind of that right it's just like how do we start generating programming ideas together because we don't have those opportunities we don't have tons of opportunities as teaching artists, as um, as folks that do programming, right, and as administrators to engage in these discussions with others that are attempting to engage in these discussions, to have these vulnerable and very transparent conversations, right? Like usually those conversations are happening internally within the organization, not across organizations, not across um you know platforms right um not across disciplines um and i think that's uh and I, I know my interest you know and, and and lynn you and i have talked about this too right like my interest is you know how can we encourage more of that how can we encourage more resource sharing so we can learn from each other's experiences and also like each other's lack of experience, right? Because that, that also teaches a lot. Um, and, and to it, Courtney's point, across disciplines too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think very much to like what Megan, Megan said earlier, right? Like, I think sometimes it's, it's uh, I think the answers are there. We're, we're just, we're just not, we need to reframe them. Right, so we can think about them in a different way, um, you know. But I, but I do think that sometimes um, I, I also used to work for um, art resources and teaching, which uh, you know is now dissolved, um, you know. But one of the things that we did at ART was that, um, you know, earlier on I, I worked there for about seven years uh, as a staff artist. And one of the first things, when I first started teaching there, you know, we had set programs that had been created for us. Um, we had our objectives, we had a timeline, we had materials, everything was predetermined for us as teaching artists, right? Um, and sometimes that worked, sometimes it did not, right? But we were we were pretty 
like we were pretty animate, right? I'm like, on day one, this is what happens, right? And it worked really well in some schools and it didn't work that well in other schools, right? Um, later on, what we started doing is, you know, those, those were programs that worked for some schools, you know, and, and, and we didn't say, we're going to dump this, right? Because it doesn't work for everyone, but it worked for the schools that it worked for. We left that program there. But what we ended up deciding to do was that we wanted to start really, um, one, we really started, we wanted to have more buy-in from teaching artists, you know, because we realized that, you know, as, a, as amazing as the teaching artists that we were working with were, right, like sometimes it just became like stagnant, it just became boring, right, because you're teaching the same thing, literally the same way all the time, right, um, and then some teaching artists were really great at that, and they were okay with it. And the other teachers and artists were like, you know, if I have to talk about another equilateral triangle sculpture, you know, like we're done, right? But what we started doing is we really started thinking about our mission as an organization, thinking about you know arts integration, right, and and what arts integration meant for the organization, and we started you know, applying for, for funding so we could actually invite teaching artists to develop programming with us, you know? Um, and, and we would have, we would have professional development. Some of it was led by, by external partners. A lot of it was led by us, right? Literally sitting in a group to, in a room together and saying, okay, this is, this is a program that already exists, you know, and I'm thinking about what you what you had said, Megan, you know, and Alexis about like these ideas around teaching artists, right? Or or just like thinking about programming. They're like, if 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 we know that this is the program and these are the things that are missing, right? How can we start with what's missing, right? and start implementing some of the things that we know that we're good at, right? And completely generate new programming, you know, that are that is focusing on like specific neighborhoods. That was the other thing too, that we did not try to create programming that would fit all of Chicago. We had specific neighborhoods that we were focusing on, you know, that we wanted to, um, that we wanted to focus on specifically at that time, we we're focusing on Austin neighborhood and we we're focusing on back of the arts. Um, and what we did is that we, you know, specifically reached out to five schools in Austin and we told them, hey, you know, we're, we're planning this long-term thing, right? Where we wanna collaborate with you and think about, you know, what your needs are thinking about, you know, the, the work that you would like to do, right? Like some of the arts education that you would like to have present in your schools, right? This is our model. This is the work that we do as, as ART, right? Um, these are the multitude of programming that we offer. Um, and what we started to do is that, you know, initially we, you know, again, brought in these teaching artists and said, you know, the school said that they wanted these certain things. These are the amounts of time that we would have. Um, and we followed a model very much to, you know, various models out there, right? Where we started doing residencies of, you know, eight sessions. We started doing residencies of, you know, 14, 15 sessions. And then we started doing after school programming. We started doing professional development. And thinking about all these models that already exist within these new like frameworks. And I have to tell you, you know, it's like um, the teaching artists that were already interested in developing programming with us, because we were working directly with those teaching artists, the programming was just so much richer. Right. And there was things that we that we ended up doing, you know, that we would have never thought of, 
you know, um, and at that time, you know, like, um, you know, ART was also like mostly visual artist, you know, but we did have uh, storytellers that started incorporating more music into the storytelling that they were doing. You know, we started thinking of residencies as multi-part residencies, right? Where we would start with music or we would start with dance and then we would move on to visual arts and then we would move on to something else, right? And thinking about, you know, interdisciplinary collaborations amongst the teaching artists and the work, right? Yes, Courtney, Art Look. Art Look is such a great platform for that, right? On, on thinking about, um, what types of programming schools are interested in. Um, and I think part of it is that, you know, it's it was the weaving of the of the multiple art forms or the collaborations, right? Between the collaborations between like a visual arts teaching artist and the musicians um, that that I think was really, you know, like now it it seems like super simple. It's like, why didn't we ever think about this before, right? Uh, but at that point, it was like revolutionary for us. We're like, why hadn't we even thought about it that way? You know, um, and I know uh, Pro's Arts, you know, which, um, you know, it changed its name to Elevarte, but Pro's Arts, Jean Parisi specifically, Jean Parisi, Kai Overstreet, and Elvia Rodriguez, you know, would create these really beautiful programs, right? Where they would incorporate performance or music, right? With theater, with visual arts, right? And they would create these really rich programs, right? That were in communication with each other and were, and were like feeding, you know, off of each other's creativity. So, everything was in kind of siloed right but they were they were working to together towards like you know the end of a production of a play right or um uh, some type of performance and exhibition um but i think um mm -hmm. sorry i'm like distracted by the chat but uh, but yes, you know, like really thinking about um, ways that we can start thinking about our programming as, as a more collaborative model, right? Even, even internally, right? Like, um, you know, thinking about what, what we might, who we might need to invite into the conversation to help us shift the, the work that we're doing, you know? Because um, I think that's part, that's part of it, right? Like, and 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 I think you know, going back to the to the you know what Courtney and and, and others you know put on the chat earlier on, right? It's really about the flexibility, right? And asking, right? Is your organization, is your institution, does it have the flexibility to do that, right? And if it does, right, then you should explore that. Right, with intention and with a slowness of figuring out like what fits you and the work that you do and the work that you're interested in doing. Um, and then being okay with saying like, you know, that work doesn't, you know, we're interested in doing that work, but we're just not there yet. Um, and I think those are all completely valid, you know, but I think we need to reimagine what our what our programming can be you know and if it doesn't fit the things that we that we want them to fit i don't think we should force them to do that right but i do think that we need to you know we need to engage in more conversations about creating new programming that allows that flexibility that allows that playfulness um to to emerge right, from like these collaborations that then we can invite other people into. Yes, yeah, Lynn, and I think, yes, and, and create that culture within your own organization, right, um, for that playfulness, for those conversations, for that um, advocacy, right, to, to invite more people into conversations of what programming can look like 
that we've uh, we might have not thought of inviting them into before. Um, and I think you know very much the point, right? Um, yeah, rethinking our organizations, right? Um, and 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 very much the point I think for for me, right? Um, specifically thinking about um, ART and my experiences with art resources and teaching. Uh, along with, you know, pros arts was that whoever was doing the programming before it was decided what it was, we were invited into the conversations of what we imagined it could be, right? And then we would create it, right? Once we would create it, then we would um, invite folks, you know, to, to collaborate, right. And say like, Hey, we know that you, you are interested in this work. What are you looking for? And then we would come together to create it and then present it back. Um, and I don't know, I think, you know, it, it's a, it's slower work. Um, but I think it's, it's absolutely, absolutely necessary. And I think we can have models that are are contradictory sometimes right as long as they're not harmful right but i think we can have models that are that are models that like this this is what we do and this is what this program does and that's it there's like really no flexibility um and then we can have other programs where you know there could be a lot more flexibility and a, a lot more time and space to invite folks to collaborate and 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 I like to frame it as play, right? But you know, to research with us and 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 think of new ways that our particular work can look like. I was gonna actually ask you, William, to expand, but you did uh, intuitively on that notion of contradictory models. Um, but just to make sure I understand what you're saying, you're suggesting that um, you don't have to have necessarily a fixed delivery system or aesthetic for your programming, that in fact, you might have sort of a, um, a complex um, system of structures based on the particular need. Um, and if, if I get that correctly, then I have a follow-up question, but is that what you were saying? Yes, and and yes, Lynn, because I think I think sometimes, okay, it's gonna be really, really brutally honest here, right? I think sometimes institutions want to change when they're not built to change. Mm. Right? No matter how much they want this programming, they can't create it because they were not mm. built for that. Right? So you have to completely reimagine what your organization does. I'm sorry, is it okay if I say something? Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, there was another session about equity. And I don't know if uh, from your experience you ran into this situation, um, but it's just, I think it's just like that, you know, that people want change or maybe the administration wants change, but then there's no like, I mean, there's no diversity, there's no inclusion, there's no equity. I don't know how to explain it really. It's just some words that I'm, 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 I'm trying to put into my thinking now. And then the issue is not really that the students are, are not responding to the, to the art, like uh, teach, the teaching art, in my experience, but or it's not so much like adjusting what I do for different schools, but where, where I find traction is um, with staff in different schools and the different ways to go about it. You know, like how, um, like my recent experience was like, you know, like people who ask like many questions about your contract and this and that, you know, trying to create kind of wahala like trouble or like, and you don't know how much you have to say, that's not your job there, you know what I mean? Or like, or people ask you to do their Xeroxing or other stuff that, you know, like some, some stuff of that nature. I don't know if you guys ran into these things or how to like, 
explain these things to yourself really or how to handle yeah i mean i think i think this is where <laughs> you know oh my god so i need like and then we can even talk about just like expectations of the teaching artists that we work with right um um like how much support to provide like what what's <laughs> yeah like what what is their role right like um but i think i think this is where you know i think this is where right like I think sometimes institutions are built, they're not built for equity, right? Like they're, they're, that was never the intention, right? Of, of, of why programming was created. Um, it wasn't created, right? To be representative of the global majority, right? Um, and I think, you know, I think people have to just be okay with that, right? Like. And, and I think if you are want to reimagine what the work can look like, then we need to reimagine what the programming looks like and what the institution is doing. You know, um, I think there's always going to be a shift of relevancy, right? And like, how can I make my organization relevant to the conversations that are that are currently happening? You know, and I think that, um, you know, there's there's ways for us to shift those conversations, um, you know, and, and I think those conversations are, are really important to be had, right, across organizations, whether the, whether the organization is big or small, right? Um, the question is always like, how can we how can we create programming that isn't causing harm, right? How can we collaborate with folks that are not causing harm, you know? But also like, how do we generate, right? Like opportunities for people to celebrate, for people to have a meaningful experience with art making, whether that's through dance, whether that's through music, right? Whether that's through visual, whatever art form, right, where they are able to see themselves in those representations, you know, and I think, you know, we, we have to rethink of what our work looks like, and I think it has to shift, um, and I think that, you know, to, to your point, Lynn, right, like, there's, you know, I say contradictions, they're not really contradictions, right, but, like, I think that there can be multiple ways of existing, right, within an organization, and all those ways are valid because they're for different audiences, right? The question is, right, like how can we rethink the way that we're doing our programming in order to invite more people into these conversations so they don't become exclusive or exclusionary? right, of folks that might not see themselves in this work. And it takes time and flexibility, <laughs> right? And it also takes a willingness to have these conversations, right? Like, like I'm, I'm part of, I'm part of, um, you know, of work that's been, you know, that is happening here in Chicago around, you know, reimagining programming, right? For for larger institutions with very, very, you know, sizable budgets, right? Annual budgets. You know, and and the conversation is like, well, if we're thinking about creating equitable programming that is more inviting to the populations that we want to serve and that we are serving like you know the first question was like how much are people getting paid right and is that equitable across the different positions right like let's start there right like how are you inviting more folks into your board that are reflective 
of the populations that you want to teach, that you are teaching. What is the purpose of a board, right? And, and I think it's, it's so, it, it be, can become very complicated and layered, you know, but I think we need to have the conversations and start working towards something, right? That, that, that we can, that is manageable, that is, um, that opens up both us as individuals and the organization to have deeper conversations about why we want to do this work, why we want to do this work within the spaces that we are doing it in, and how can we you know, create these brave spaces for ourselves and for our organizations, institutions, right? To push, to push the boundaries of, you know, of what makes us feel um, comfortable, right? And, and ask hard questions, you know, that, that might make us feel uncomfortable at first, but will allow us to, to grow and, and think about our work on a deeper level. But the work is there, people are doing it. Some, some organizations are doing really great work, others are struggling, right? And I think it's really important to have those conversations of like how we're struggling too. Cause I think we also like try to present all this as like, look at this shiny thing that we created, right? And we don't like talking about the messiness of, or the hardships, the challenges that we went through in order to reach out in the shiny stage. And I'm more, I'm particularly interested in the messiness Right, because I'm. I think it's, you know, it, you know, the shiny pieces are beautiful to look at, right? And I can enjoy them, and admire them, but um, I think that I'm like more interested in in the messiness, because I think that's where the real work is happening, right? And and the vulnerability of what it means, right, to to make mistakes and to attempt to fix the harm that we are causing, that we have caused. And how do we model that for ourselves, for each, each other, right? So we don't put each other on pedestals, but we're actively looking and modeling what this work can look like and, and, and it's messy. That is so great. And I feel like we need like another hour <laughs> to keep having these conversations. Um, but unfortunately we have come to the end of our time. Um, so we just have a couple of things that we wanna say before we let everyone go. Um, first of all, thank you to William, you are brilliant and excellent. And it's such a joy talking with you. And thank you to all of you who are here. Um, it has really just made for such a rich conversation and we definitely will have more opportunities for conversations like this coming in the future. Um, also, we are constantly making improvements to our learning sessions and your feedback is really important to that. So uh, please fill out the exit survey in the chat before you leave here, it's super important. Um, and if you're interested in learning more ways to engage in civic practice, uh, you should definitely join us on May 26th for building responsive arts programs through co-creation and civic practice. Uh, that is with our fifth house performers and educators and also Constellation residents. Parker Nelson and Kelsey Zaraga. And William can tell you he was there at, at, at their last session. It's just uh, some brilliant, brilliant stuff. And then we have another two part session that um, is coming up this month with our Constellation resident from Sky Art, Michael Rangel. And Part one of Youth Centered Art Making Spaces addresses how we care for our vulnerable youth 
before, during, and after we work with them in our space or in their space. And then in part two, Michael will lead us through reframing classroom management in a more student-centered way that addresses the culture of our art spaces. So this is also something that would be really helpful for thinking about for your teaching artists, um, for thinking about for you. And you can register for those events and see other events at the link that Courtney's gonna drop in the chat. That's our events page. Um, and one last thing there should be coming to you eventually um, a professional learning survey. And that is really, really important for all of our um, arts partners to fill out for us because that's how we decide what programming we have for you all for the next year. So when you get that in your inbox, make sure that you send it to your other colleagues who may not have gotten it, encourage people to take it, let them know that the way that our programming is so wonderful is because of the feedback that we get from you all. And with that, have a brilliant rest of your week. Um, William definitely has uh, offered to continue those conversations. He's very open uh, with continuing to chat with you. And same here. So have a great week. Thank you, everyone.